Hi folks, welcome back. This is the first part of a lecture series on writing English prose, improving your writing style. Specifically, we'll be looking at words, sentences, and paragraphs. And this uh, first part is a will be an overview of what it means to write good sentences, how do we know what's good, what's bad, and that will involve a look back at the rhetorical appeals that we talked about uh, way back in the first part of this uh, course. Uh, however, I want to get the ball rolling with some great uh, English prose from some master stylists. And the first example here, the first sample, is from W.E.B. Du Bois, who wrote a book called The Souls of Black Folk. And uh, the passage uh, goes something like this. Between me and the other world, there is ever an unasked question. Unasked by some, through feelings of delicacy. By others, through the difficulty of rightly framing it. All, nevertheless, flutter around it. They approach me in a half-hesitant kind of sort of way, eye me curiously or compassionately, and then, instead of saying directly, how does it feel to be a problem? They say, uh, I know an excellent colored man in my town, or I fought at Mechanicsville, or do not these southern outrages make your blood boil? At these I smile, or am interested, or reduce the spoiling to a simmer as the occasion may require. To the real question, how does it feel to be a problem? I answer seldom a word. So some great prose there from W.E.B. Du Bois. If you look at, the, at this passage, you'll notice that there are certain uh, words and constru uh, constructions that are repeated for effect. Uh, for example, unasked question, then he uses that same word uh, right after that, unasked by some. And then, uh, when you set up a phrase like this, it creates a certain anticipation in the, in the ear. So, unasked by some through feelings of delicacy. You know, it's like, <laughs> you can just listen to this and tell there needs to be something uh, to fill in that blank there. So, he offers that uh, other part. Um, and then he's got some nice metaphors in here about uh, the uh, southern outrages make your blood boil. And then he goes back to that metaphor shortly thereafter with... Um, at the, uh, reducing the boil to a simmer. So lots of uh, metaphor work there, lots of nice rhythms and cadences in this passage. It's no wonder this is considered uh, a really great example of English prose. Our next example is from Edward Gibbon, and he wrote a book, a very famous and celebrated work of history, called The Decline and Fall of the Roman Civilization. It's considered a master of English prose. And the passage I want to read to you again comes from the very first part of the book. It goes something like this. In the second century of the Christian era, the empire of Rome comprehended the fairest part of the earth and the most civilized portion of mankind. The frontiers of that extensive monarchy were guarded by ancient renown and disciplined valor. The gentle but powerful influence of laws and manners had gradually cemented the union of the provinces. Their peaceful inhabitants enjoyed and abused the advantages of wealth and luxury. The image of a free constitution was preserved with decent reverence. The Roman Senate appeared to possess the sovereign authority and devolved on the emperors all the executive powers of government. It is the, the design of this, and of the two succeeding chapters, to describe the prosperous condition of their empire, and afterwards, from the death of Marcus Antoninus, to deduce the most important circumstances of its decline and fall, a revolution which will ever be remembered, and is still felt by the nations of the earth. So really great prose there. It just feels majestic to read it. I hope you enjoyed listening to it. A lot of, uh, again, a lot of structural parallels, really nice uh, sentences uh, here. Uh, you notice, uh, just even the way these passages sound reinforce the message that he's trying to get across, particularly that last line, a revolution which will ever be remembered and is still felt by the nations of the earth. So if you listen to those syllables there, and the uh, sort of stresses on the words, you'll notice it's not just an accident uh, that it sounds good when you read it aloud. Um, obviously, Edward Gibbon uh, was very concerned with the sound of words and the, um, all of these structures that go into his sentences. That's why he's such a remarkable writer. And the uh, last example I have here is from uh, Charlotte Bronte's book, uh, Jane Eyre. It's quite different, but uh, still a remarkable stylistic technique. So this is the first part of the book. 
There was no possibility of taking a walk that day. We had been wandering, indeed, in the leafless shrubbery an hour in the morning, but since dinner, Mrs. Reed, when there was no company, dined early, the cold winter wind had brought with it clouds so somber and a rain so penetrating that further outdoor exercise was now out of the question. I was glad of it. I never liked long walks, especially on chilly afternoons. Dreadful to me was the coming home in the raw twilight with nipped fingers and toes and a heart saddened by the chidings of Bessie, the nurse, and humbled by the consciousness of my physical inferiority to Eliza, John, and Georgiana Reed. <laughs> uh, really great uh, uh, passages there. Notice there's some fancy work with colons and semicolons there, but it's really all about creating a certain uh, audio texture, if you will. Uh, a rhythm that goes with a tone and a, a mood that she's trying to set uh, with these structures. Notice the stuff in parentheses here. Uh, Mrs. Reed, when there was no company, dined early. Uh, so that's kind of a technique where it's almost like she's pulling the reader aside and whispering something uh, in his or her ear. You know, so you feel a little close, closer, like you're the confidant of the of the author. A lot of uh, balanced structures there as well with the, uh, let's see, um, uh, the clouds so somber and a rain so penetrating. Uh, so that's some parallelism uh, that we'll get into uh, shortly. Okay, so usually when you start talking about prose style, and throwing around some jargon, it can really confuse people and uh, just kind of intimidate them. So what I like to do is come back away from those, the, the jargon and the metaphor, and, or, <laughs> sorry, go uh, away from the jargon and towards the metaphors uh, that people are more comfortable with, namely food. I'm a big fan of the show Hell's Kitchen with Gordon Ramsay. And if you watch the show, you know he pays attention not just to the way food tastes, uh, but everything there is to know about the gourmet experience. And so we talk, you know, he'll have uh, uh, parts of the show where they talk about ingredients, you know, getting the best ingredients, uh, presentation, the way the food is arranged on the plate, the way that it looks, uh, the temperature of the food. Uh, the taste, obviously. And then I, I've just added here two things that he doesn't really talk about very much, but uh, the digestion, digestion of the food and then the nutritional contents. So I think these are good metaphors to work with as far as writing style. And it even has some history. Uh, Plato, uh, the, one of the most, probably the most famous philosopher of all time, uh, liked to compare rhetoric to cookery. Now, he did, I don't know if he really meant that in a flattering kind of way, uh, but I think it does make a lot of sense to compare the two. So if we're talking about essays, uh, what does this have to do with these, uh, these criteria? Well, I think there's nice, you can match them up pretty nicely. So the ingredients, you can't make a good dish without good ingredients. Um, same thing with an essay. You can't make it write a good essay if you don't have good research, if you don't have good facts, if you don't have good uh, specific details to put in there. On the other hand, uh, sometimes on the show, uh, Gordon Ramsay will challenge the contestants by having them prepare a dish with very cheap, uh, you know, off-the-shelf ingredients, nothing special about them, uh, but still, can you turn those ordinary, common ingredients into something gourmet? The uh, same thing with essays. A really good writer can take a topic, doesn't matter how boring of a topic it might seem to be, a really good writer can make it interesting. Uh, the presentation, uh, that sort of lines up with the design of the document, the uh, layout, formatting, how you space out your paragraphs. Uh, temperature, I like to think of this as the hot topic. The How fresh is the topic? Is it something that's been done to death? Is it cliche? Are people sick of it? Or is it something that's contemporary, uh, that maybe there's been something in the news lately that relates to it, so you can really hook the reader's attention? Uh, taste. Uh, this has to do with style. Again, uh, you know, a sentence that's easy to read aloud, that sounds good, that's memorable, it's going to be a lot tastier uh, than one that's long and difficult to read, cumbersome. And then uh, digestion, I would link that up to the comprehension. So how easy is this if you're trying to get some information out of an essay and you get that information easily and painlessly, and you know, I think that's pretty good. Kind of reminds me of a good digestion. And then nutritional value. I think of this as uh, the memorability of an essay. So if you read an essay and you, you continue to think about it even days, maybe even weeks afterward, and you realize it's really made a change in your life, you, maybe you're reflecting on things in a better way than you did before, made you look at life differently, uh, I think that's uh, very nutritional for your mind and for your soul. So I think there's a lot of uh, nice parallels here. 
So what would a tasty sentence be like? Uh, we're going to talk about words, sentences, and paragraphs. And as you can see here, good words will make your documents more appropriate, be more familiar, easy to read, vivid. Uh, then the sentences, that'll make the, the structure sound better. That's when we'll get into different types of sentences and how to balance them together so you have a really good paragraph, uh, which is the last part. And then, then we'll be looking at basically the entire essay, looking at those chunks called paragraphs and, and how they work together to form a really coherent essay. Okay, so we need to get back to those rhetorical appeals that we talked about uh, way back in the first part of this course. Ethos, logos, pathos, and kairos. So if you use these effectively, uh, then your sentences will inspire trust. I call that ethos. Um, it'll make sense to the reader. Your logic will be easy to follow. Uh, that's logos. It will touch the heart in some way. That's what we call pathos. And then uh, the kairos would be seizing the opportunity, seizing the moment, um, writing this essay and getting it out there at the right time. We're choosing a topic uh, that has some kind of contemporary relevance to it. On the other hand, a bad sentence, or a sentence that uses these things ineffectively, it's going to raise suspicion. Uh, so bad ethos. You'd be looking at this author and thinking, you know, something doesn't add up here. Uh, instead of being clear, it will just befuddle the reader, bad logos, you won't be able to follow the logic, or you might think that the reader isn't very intelligent, hasn't really thought this through. Uh, it could just bore you to death, uh, that's bad pathos, there's no emotional connection to it whatsoever. Uh, or maybe it's spastic and it seems like the uh, writer is uh, too emotionally involved to maintain fairness. Or it could just be missing the opportunity, uh, bad kairos. So it, maybe they do choose that topic that's been done to death that nobody wants to hear about anymore, or something that's very old news, or just not the right time to be talking about that topic. Uh, that's all examples of kairos. All right, so let's start with ethos and look at some examples of poor ethos. Now, so if the sentence has poor ethos, that'll mean that when you read it, you get the impression of the author being lazy, sloppy, indecisive, you don't really know, he doesn't seem, he or she doesn't really seem to have an opinion on it. Um, ignorant or rude. So I've got some examples here of these uh, sentences with bad ethos. Uh, so the first one, studies prove that smoking is absolutely safe and actually improves health. And they have a reference to Marlboro.com. Well, again, uh, e even beyond the fact that you wouldn't expect Marlboro.com to have an objective stance on this issue, words like prove, very suspicious, especially when you're talking about a science or studies. A science doesn't prove anything. All it does is accumulate evidence that suggests something might be the case. But you never hear a scientist saying, uh, this study has proven something. You'll never hear a real scientist say that. Uh, so that's very suspicious right there. And then all the words like absolutely and uh, <laughs> uh, you know, actually. Uh, these are, again, you know, most scientists like to leave a little wiggle room in there. Um, but anyway, uh, obviously this is very bad ethos. Number two is bad ethos for another reason. 50% uh, of students said there were plenty of parking spaces. 60% indicated the opposite. <laughs> well, that's bad math. So if the uh, author can't even be bothered to break out a calculator to figure out what adds up to 100%, we're rightfully to be suspicious. And then uh, the third one there, uh, professors should allow texting in class. Those old folkies are stuck in the dark ages. Well, this is an example of bad ethos because it actually insults the audience. You never want to do that. Uh, you want to respect the reader. If you respect the reader, that'll come across and the readers will respect you and be more likely to listen to what you have to say. If you just come out insulting them, uh, they'll just turn away right off the bat, tune you out, and you won't be able to make your case. All right, what about poor logos uh, then? So if you have bad logos, that's going to make you look careless, ignorant, prejudiced, dishonest, <laughs> or childish. So here's some examples of that. Uh, one, the only possible solution is to allow smoking anywhere at any time. Well, again, if you are saying things like there's only one solution, that's a little suspicious. It makes you sound like, you know, you've already got an opinion and you don't want to listen to alternatives. Uh, so you always want to seem a little bit more open-minded than this. Uh, two, if all men are mortal and Socrates is a man, then Socrates must be immortal. <laughs> okay, bad logic. 
Uh, so if this, you know, if you have an error like that in your paper, uh, the author or the reader is rightfully to be uh, questioning your ability to reason, which will diminish your credibility considerably. See, all these kind of tie together, right? Uh, the three, uh, third one, I got an A on my paper when I wore a red shirt. All students should wear red shirts. <laughs> so, had the hasty uh, generalization there. There's a lot of these logical fallacies that authors can get into. Uh, we'll talk about these maybe in a, a future lecture. Uh, but just for now, think about the way that you're reasoning and make sure that you can take a few steps back and make sure these steps to your conclusion actually make sense. All right, then we get into pathos, which is the emotional appeal. So if you have bad, ethos, I mean, bad pathos, uh, that might make you seem apathetic, insincere, insincere, biased maybe, or just uh, downright emotionally unstable, something you probably don't want. Uh, this is why the, most teachers will tell you, never use an exclamation point in your academic essays, because that's sort of shouting. And if you're academic, it means you're supposed to be cool, calm, and collected, not shouting at somebody. But anyway, here's some examples of bad pathos. One, I really hate the disgusting odor of cigarettes. And yes, I also hate the fools who foist their nasty stench upon the world. <laughs> so again, I would not expect this author to have anything unbiased or unprejudiced to say about smoking. They're obviously very much, uh, very ve vehemently against it. Two, I am very sorry that you interpreted what I said incorrectly. <laughs> <laughs> so this example is one of those faux apologies. So it sort of sounds like an apology, but then when you get into it, you realize they're not actually apologizing. They're just uh, insinuating that you are, are it, 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 an idiot. Uh, they didn't interpret it right. Uh, so again, very uh, questionable eth uh, pathos. <laughs> All right, and the third example. However, some scientists idiotically disagree with my irrefutable proof. So again... Uh, the emotionalism here, it seemed like the author's a little bit angry or a little insecure somehow, using words like idiotically, that's uh, something angry that you would say that's just going to insult the audience. Uh, saying your proof is irrefutable, putting scientists in quotation marks, again, this just doesn't sound like a, a scholarly tone. All right, then we get into Kairos, the timing appeal. Now, if you have poor Kairos, that'll just make you look ignorant, like you haven't been keeping up to date with your research, or disrespectful. You're not really respecting the uh, reader's time. So look at the first example. The study from 1804 shows that smoking is a perfectly healthy activity. <laughs> well, there's been a little bit of scientific progress since 1804, so we have to wonder about that. So when you, again, when you're doing your research, make sure you have up-to-date articles. Otherwise, people will think you have bad kairos. Uh, two, again I say, two arms, two arms. We must do whatever it takes to end school shootings. Uh, so we got some school shootings and then you're using phrases like two arms, uh, two arms, uh, very bad uh, timing uh, with that expression. Uh, you don't want to use any phrases like that anywhere near something about a school shooting. Uh, three, now that we've reached the third paragraph, let me introduce my topic. So <laughs> that's sort of bad timing in your, with your organization. Always should uh, introduce the topic in the first part of the paper, not leave it till the third paragraph. Okay, so then, good academic writing will have good ethos, so it'll look well-researched, be clear, you'll have appropriate terminology, that's also called diction, correct formatting, grammar, and mechanics. All of those things will make you look more credible. Uh, two, the good logos part will mean it seems well-reasoned, it's thoughtful, sensible, clear. The good pathos would be the author, make you feel like the author is calm, open-minded, fair, considerate and respectful, and confident. And then uh, the path uh, kairos is going to, again, seem timely. It'll be up-to-date, innovative, fresh, and relevant, hopefully, to some uh, contemporary topic. All right, so that'll do for the overview. In the next lecture, we'll get into word choices.